The sound is very low. Hereby open, I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I welcome Mr. Charles Kumar Samal, and he will defend his academic thesis, Immune Mechanisms and Potential Immunological Treatment in Atherosclerosis. And he will defend his thesis here now at Maastricht University, and he will defend his thesis in uh, Sweden at the 2nd of June. And this is part of a double degree. Um, I welcome all members of the degree committee here present and present online and um, I will introduce now the three supervisors and later on the five opponents. The supervisors are Professor Reutlingsberger, he's Professor of Biochemistry of Apoptosis at Maastricht University. The second supervisor is uh, Professor Schurgers, he is Professor of Biochemistry of Vascular Calcification and the third supervisor is Professor Frostegard. Uh, he is Chief Physician Unit Head and Professor of Medicine at the Department of Institute of Environmental Medicine, Karolinska Institute, Sweden. And of course, I welcome all uh, people here in the aula and of course, all followers of the live stream. Uh, Mrs. Samal, may I ask you to give a presentation with a summary of your thesis? Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Professor. I really appreciate and I'm glad I can. Okay, so uh, so thank you everyone for joining me today for my defense ceremony. And the topic of my presentation is immune mechanism and potential immunological treatment in atherosclerosis. So uh, I start with a statistical uh, background where it, I got it from WHO and it says cardiovascular disease, CVD, are the leading cause of death globally. An estimated of 17.9 million people died from CVD in 2019, and representing 32% of the global deaths. That's a huge number. And of these deaths, 85% were due to heart attack and stroke. Over three quarters of CVD that takes place in low and middle income countries. As you can see on the left with the map, these are the countries where like, they are like very highly significant death rates. So the topic is atherosclerosis. I'll uh, take you a brief about atherosclerosis, how it happens and what are the causes of being an atherosclerotic plaque. So atherosclerosis, as it says, athero is prodigy, sclerosis is hardening. So as you can see on the left picture here, uh, you can see the, the normal vessel, the normal artery, and then there is a blockage. So for you to understand, it's just blockage of artery. It's a very complex mechanism, but as you can see in the photo, it looks simple, but it's a blockage with a lot of plaques and dead cells into it. Since my uh, thesis focuses on antibodies, so I would like you all to know what are these antibodies and what are the types of these antibodies we have in our body. So depending on the presence, depending on their uh, characteristics, they are defined as five types, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgG, IgD, and IgE. So they have a variety of functions, to it and they are also helping us in getting our like, first immune response to the body. And as you can see on the right side, so we have distribution of these antibodies. So all, in circulation, there are four types of antibodies, IgG, IG, uh, IgM, IgE, and IgD, except IgA. As we all know, IgA is important 
as well for the COVID now with the COVID antibodies is becoming more popular. So uh, then we go further. So it's like oxidized phospholipid in focus. So there are mainly two uh, phospholipid which I focus in my thesis. First is phosphoylcholine and second is mineral aldehyde. So about phosphoylcholine, so it's a damp and PAM, which is danger associated molecular pattern and PAM, which is a pathogen associated molecular pattern. So these are expressed in bacteria, mammalian cells, nematodes, and it's a component of oxidized LDL, which I will be talking in a few moments from now. And melaldehyde is a uh, byproduct or an end product, you can say, of a lipid peroxidation process. So why phospholipids are called damp, what, which is danger associated molecular pattern. So as you can see in the, in the illustration now, there is a healthy uh, project model of uh, lipid bilayer where we cannot see any kind of epitopes expressed to it because it's a living cell. But when the cells are in danger conditions, they're dying or they're stressed, or they're like microvesicles, leaking mitochondria, all these things happens to the cells a lot of time. So there you can see these kind of epitopes exposing on the surface, which are phosphoylcholine, phosphodetalserine, oxidized cardiolipin, and melanoandehyde. And there are a few others as well. So these are the small lipid derivative of phosphoylcholine. These are like small haptin-like molecule. And MDA is also a dangerous certain molecular pattern, but not as a PAM. So MDA is damp, which is dangerous certain molecular pattern. And uh, phosphoylcholine is a PAM, which is a pathogen associated molecular pattern. So what is, it's been known from the, from the literature that they promote uh, more of, uh, inflammation and they have uh, immunity in atherosclerosis if it is anti-MDA, which is or anti-PC, which is antibodies against phosphylcholine or antibodies against melanoandehyde. So what exactly it has is the low levels of these antibodies, phosphylcholine or melanoandehyde, have a multi-layer load, uh, load on the cells, and then they increase burden on pro-inflammatory effects like oxidized LDL or oxidized phospholipids, we can say. And they also uh, decrease the clearance capacity. So with the, with the thesis, you get to know how this antibody acts as helping in clearance of dead cells and uh, helps as a being a more anti-inflammatory properties. So potential electroprotective effects and anti-inflammatory mechanisms by human anti-PC. So mostly, as I said before, it's inhibition of pro-inflammatory phospholipid effects. It helps in decrease of oxygen LDL attaching to the macrophages inhibition of cell death caused by major lysins, which is lysophosphatidylcholine, and it helps in increased clearance of dead cells. So the novel concept, which was developed in Postegard's lab, was low levels of this IgM and particular IgG1 subtypes of anti-PC and anti-MDA is a risk marker. When you have a high levels in your body of these uh, antibodies, it corresponds to have a protection role. So that is what we have been published, and it's more than 50 papers Till now, but Frostegard lab has been published in the last few decades. So we have seen a lot of negative association with atherosclerosis and CVD. Uh, we have seen a lot of independent risk factors, which is in SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, and a lot of uremic cohorts. So we do a lot of cohort studies where we find this kind of uh, associations to be very significant. And previously, the mouse experiments with active and passive immunization shows a lot of atheroprotective effects. It has been published uh, and cited a lot of different papers. So the most important technique which I used uh, for my uh, uh, analysis or for me measurement, uh, doing a quantitative measurements from the serum samples is ELISA. And uh, mostly there are four kinds of ELISA, but in the picture you can see only three because I used three kinds of ELISA, indirect ELISA, uh, competitive ELISA and sandwich ELISA. But I'll focus on indirect ELISA because that is what has been uh, developed into a product now, and it can be useful for a lot of uh, different analysis. So uh, in direct ELISA, you have antigen, then you have a primary antibodies, which we get it from the serum sample or which we get it from the uh, blood of a human patient. And then you have a specific secondary antibody attached to it. And that secondary antibody will have an enzyme or a substrate that gives a reaction. And then the color change and you measure that color as a quantitative measurement. So. Now I'll completely go to the results of my studies. So this is the first study, which is antibodies against melanodehyde in hemodialysis patients and its association with clinical outcomes, differences between subclasses and isotypes. So as you can see here, the, the dark one is the lower tertile, the darker line, and the lighter line is middle and the, uh, the third tertile. 
So what we can see is the lower the level of these antibodies have more of the cumulative incidence. Uh, so as you can see from the figure here, uh, that low IgM antibodies, we found like a lot of association with IgG1, IgG, and IgM uh, in this cohort. And most likely uh, we have a very striking results with IgG1 and IgM. So which can be discussed, uh, which we'll be discussing further in the discussion section. Then the second paper was published with uh, the same cohort and it is with phosphorylcholine, as I said. And here also we found a lot of significant associations with different uh, biochemical parameters. We have different biological uh, biochemical assays done. And then we have different uh, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory cytokines measurements with different uh, medications given to the patient. And here also we found the, the uh, outcome as a death. And the death is higher in terms of if you have a very low level, the mortality rate is very high as compared to if you have a higher level, the mortality rate decreases. So that's, that's the outcome from these two uh, papers from the study. Then I switch it to study two, which is antibodies against phosphorylcholine among 60 years old. So it's an elderly, populist, uh, elderly uh, populated co cohort, which people have a median age of 60 years. And we try to see the clinical role in this cohort of these antibodies and the simulator interactions. So in the left figure, you can see uh, the, the confidence interval as well as the results. So we try to uh, segregate in three different kinds of analysis. One is overall CVD. The second one is uh, stroke. And third one is myocardial infarction and angina pectoris. So as you can see, there are a lot of uh, strong association for uh, IG, uh, IgG, then IgG1, and then IgG2. So if you see IgG1, for example, the higher the number of stars is more than all the significant figures you have. So lower levels have higher cumulative incidence rate of having CVD or stroke or MI or angina. So with this, we did a lot of different analysis to see what are these antibodies actually do. So we have taken three different kinds of antibodies. One is uh, low binding affinity, one is with medium binding affinity, and one is with a higher binding affinity. So uh, here on the picture, we can see how these antibodies have a particular role and why they behave indifferently from each other because of the mutation they have. And because of the different uh, trans, uh, post-translational modification, they behave differently from each other and they have a different binding capacity uh, compared to each other. And third, we know we found like what are the different uh, residues of amino acids around the molecule. So, so they help in uh, having more of this dissociation constant and they have more in terms of binding affinity. So with this, we tried to do it simulate in a video form. So this is how uh, the heavy chain and the light chain of the variable region interact with the phosphorylcholine. And this is how in three different uh, antibodies, which I'm talking about. Yeah, so now I come to study three. So this is one of the most interesting study, which from my thesis, and which is about potential immun uh, natural immunization against atherosclerosis in hibernating bears. So people might assume like why we went to bears instead of humans. So we have been doing research on humans, but with uh, one paper came with from Peter Steinwinkel's lab about the animal kingdom. And that fascinated me and Johan, my supervisor at KI. And we wanted to see how these uh, natural antibodies, what we had, we, what so-called anti-PC and anti-MDA have a role in terms of this cohort where we have uh, bears, tigers, polar bears, but this paper is only about bears. So as you can see, we have uh, measured a lot of different biochemical parameters. It's age, weight, uh, albumin level, cholesterol, glucose, uh, insulin weight, and urea, a lot of different uh, idomic toxins. The major reason is the bear, they go for hibernation for four to five months in winter. And in that time, they don't eat, they don't, do, uh, they don't go for urination. So they have a lot of idomic toxin accumulated in the body. But to, to be surprising, we have never seen any evident cases of uh, any bear dying with a CBD or CKD, so which is cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disorder. They have their arteries very clean. They don't develop any plaque. So that's really interesting. And we wanted to explore more why it happens. And since Johan has a very strong belief, this NTPC is a very strong molecule which can have a role. And that's what we proved in this paper, where we see like the low levels and high levels. So in summer and winter, the bears were taken samples from summer and winter time. And we see in summer, which is uh, cyan blue color, you see the median level 
is lower compared to the winter, which is uh, higher. So the most striking data what we have is for IgA antibodies in this cohort. So if you look at IgA, so it's like even the lower limit of uh, winter sample is the highest limit for the summer. So it's very striking. And then we did individual analysis and we proved that in winter condition, IgA and TAPC has a very significant role in giving protection and compared to other antibodies. So now we come to study four, which is also interesting and might be interesting for everyone here because it's COVID. And since uh, we believed that this antibody can work with a lot of chronic inflammatory diseases, and we know with COVID, the patient who die always have, may have cardiovascular symptoms and, or like diabetes or any of the underlying conditions, then they are more prone to uh, have mortality or they die easily in ICU. So here, what we saw was this cohort is from Maastricht, and then we have divided the patient group in three categories, severity one, severity two, and severity three. So severity one is the patient who come to the hospital, but they are not admitted. Severity two is the patient who have just a nasal oxygen level, and then they are low uh, in oxygen level, but they are not very low. But severity three is the patient who, has, who needs the immediate attention to go to ICU because they need the oxygen mask to them. So the result says what we have seen is, if you see the uh, median level, I'm not sure if it's so clear, but uh, if you can see the median level, you have in severity three, you have a very low level of anti-PC antibodies compared to severity one and two. And when, you com when we compare it with the healthy individuals, so we see they have always higher uh, amount of these antibodies. And I'll also explain why it is called natural antibodies and why it is not called natural antibodies at the end. So, and then we wanted to see the mechanistic studies, how this uh, virus gets into the body. We all know it's about with through ACE2 inhibitor. Okay, so with ACE2 receptor, sorry. So in, with ACE2 receptors, what happens is like spike protein goes and binds and gets an entryway to the uh, lipid layer and gets into the cell. But what is our hypothesis in this uh, term is that it binds to phosphorylcholine. So phosphorylcholine is a dangerous with a molecular pattern. So that's what I told before. So when you see a cell is dying or in a stress condition, see this epitope coming up with SN2, SN2 mechanism, and then uh, this uh, spike protein goes and attached to it. And then if it is true, then the thing comes like then our anti-PC antibody is directed to that. That is what it has been shown, how this antibody can neutralize the viral protein or the spike protein, and they uh, stop uh, passing through the ACE2 inhibitor into it. So with this, uh, I would have another video just to show like how it exactly looks uh, on the cell surface when antibodies bind and phosphate fall into it. Uh, so this is a, a simulation done by another colleague, Pritham from Uppsala University. Uh, yes, so I'll come back to the summary. So the right side of the picture says everything about my project. You have uh, antibodies, natural antibodies, you have COVID virus, you have uh, uh, lipid layer, and I work with heart and kidney of the human samples as well as with the, with the bear. And then we want to uh, immunize people with a, with a vaccine in future. So that's the goal. So the overall summary is uh, IgM and TMDA is a significant protection marker for mortality against CKD patients. We have found for non inflamed patients only IgG and TMDA and IgG1 and TMDA were associated with protection, not IgG2. So, for IgM and IgG1, but not IgG2 or IgA, were protection marker for mortality among CKD patients in terms of PC. So, IgG1, IgA, and TPC are strikingly high during hibernation in brown bears, while and TMDA were low. And even we couldn't detect IgA and TMDA level in the bear population. So uh, the fourth one is uh, uh, IgG1 and TPC is a protection marker for CVD among 60 year old, which is elderly population cohort, especially for stroke in men. Uh, we determined various and different properties of these anti-PC clones, what we say AO1, EO1, and EO5. Uh, and the last one is like, uh, IgM and TPC is lower in severe uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, by in silico methods, we found that how this antibody attached to RBD region and how they help in neutralizing the virus in the future. It also works with the Delta variant or the Omicron. 
So in future, the, the idea of me and Johan is to uh, raise this NTPC level in the body through immunization, which will have definitely have a therapeutic possibility. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators, my professors, my professors here at Maastricht University Quiz, Johan, uh, my supervisor at Karolinska, Johan, and the collaborators, Peter. Uh, then we have PhD students who helped me with my experiments, Nico. Uh, then Pritam, who helped me with all this biomatic, uh, bioinformatics analysis, in silico analysis. Abdul, who has uh, helped me with uh, statistical analysis. Divya, Mizan, my lab members, who always helped me with my experiments. And Rastal and Arindam, who is here as well. He's been always as a guide and mentor. And I would like to thank my paranym both for supporting me always, Sengis and others. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. The opposition will be opened by uh, Professor Bissem. He is Professor of Experimental Vascular Pathology at Maastricht University. Professor Bissem. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, my uh, congratulations, my heartfelt congratulations with this uh, very nice thesis. Yeah. Uh, Content-wise, it's very impressive work which you've done in the past few years and also would like to congratulate especially my uh, the, the, the supervisors at KI and uh, the local supervisors with this excellent uh, piece of work. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm not only here to sort of congratulate you, but also I have some nasty questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I do understand uh, being an Indian that you have this appeal for polar beers, but uh, what struck me was that these polar beers were 40 kilos. Now, the, the polar bees that I have met in my life were yeah, considerably yeah. bigger. Yeah. So, so how, how come there was that small? Uh, no, these these are not polar bears. Uh, sorry if I have not mentioned these oh. are Scandinavian brown bears. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So okay, they are good. smaller in size rather than in uh, oh, okay. compared to polar bears. But we have studied with polar bears, mm -hmm. but it has not been published yet. But okay, soon good. it will be out. We wait for that then. <laughs> so my main questions uh, relate to uh, chapter or oh, your study one and which you have studied uh, a very nice cohort on hemodialysis uh, patients, CKD5D. Uh, it's a quite a sizable cohort, 210 uh, uh, subjects in, with a follow-up, and that, that makes it uh, really interesting. Uh, so what you did, you, you, you dis dis dissected between the survivors and the, the non-survivors, and, uh, and it was not very clear to me uh, but from your introduction or from your methodology, it seems that all the uh, non-survivors uh, were dying from CKD. Is that correct? Uh, it's, uh, there were it... about 100 uh, uh, people, subjects dying in this cohort, and they all died from acute uh, uh, kidney failure, uh, coronary uh, not from uh, cardiovascular disease. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Basin, and I really appreciate you asked this question. So this is very uh, interesting to hear for everyone, is that uh, these people, it's not only about CKD or CVD, this mm -hmm. is all cause mortality. So this time, this is a follow-up study for five years, yeah. and in the five years, they have been sampled for three times at least, mm -hmm. and they have a baseline, then we have a mimic one, and then it's like the, at the end point. Mm -hmm. So basically what we found here was uh, the patient who die have really low levels of this anti-PC or anti-MDA antibodies to it, rather than uh, having a higher level. The, the, the survivors who have higher levels of these antibodies, they actually survived. So that yeah. is a very significant finding. And we always do a gender balance study. Mm -hmm. So here we see like a male and female, both the population. Okay. And we always found that uh, women have higher antibody level compared to men. So mm -hmm. that is very interesting. But on the same hand, women pays out a uh, huge price in terms of autoimmune disease. As we know, yeah. women have more of this autoimmune disease than in men. Okay, good. To SLE and Thank you. Um, now, uh, interestingly, uh, your, your cohorts, your survivors are obviously uh, a bit younger than yeah. the non-survivors. Yes. Uh, also, they were uh, having uh, more diabetes, uh, low-grade inflammation, and higher state of uh, uh, heart failure. Uh, how do these factors uh, sort of bias your outcome? Because uh, as I recall, uh, for instance, uh, there is an age-dependent decline in IgM levels yes. generally, uh, and also the other form, risk factors for, uh, uh, for mortality. Did you correct for that in some way, or were there any ways that you can exclude that this is just beyond the age-dependent decline, uh, the facts that you observed? Yes. 
thank you for this question. Uh, the answer would you, this, would uh, you please, I will would you please yeah. 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 closer to the microphone, please? Okay. Uh, so I would try to answer this question in two parts. The first part is how these antibodies are determined. So basically mm -hmm. we say it's a natural antibody. So what does it mean is natural antibodies are present by birth. So when you are born, so you are born with this kind of antibodies to it. Mm -hmm. So later in the life, but there is another code study which was published in 2020 from our one of our colleagues. They say mm -hmm. these antibodies are not so-called natural antibodies. We are talking about PC because the levels are very low when the child is born. So it's like a follow-up study of a mother and a baby cohort. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, they have been sampled before uh, the child is birth for the mother and for mm -hmm. the uh, child. It's They took the samples when they're born and they followed it for two years. And they found anti-PC antibodies are not the natural antibodies. They, uh, they are also like PAMP, as I said. Mm -hmm. So it's also pathogen associated molecular pattern. So mm -hmm. when the child is born, so they are exposed to a lot of different environmental factors, a lot of microbes. But the MDA are, huh? they MDA are natural MDA, antibodies, MDA, exactly. EO6, uh, if I uh, recall. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, but that uh, goes down with age uh, to some extent. Or did, so my, my, my question is really brief. Uh, did you uh, correct for this or did you check whether age by itself is a confounder in the, the difference that you observe? Yeah, so, so the, for confounders, we always take uh, like uh, diabetes, uh, mm -hmm. for we always check for blood pressure, hy hyperglycemia, or uh, hyper uh, cholesterol, mm -hmm. all these things. So we have always used the confounders for this, but this is a mortality study, as again, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it's all cause mortality. It's not only through CBD or CKD. It's also mm -hmm. through viral infections, and it's also through like uh, people with old age. So, yeah, okay. so there is confounders. And Sorry. so um, you have found this very interesting uh, sort of inverse relationship between uh, uh, MD, uh, MD, uh, MDA levels, yeah. natural antibody uh, levels, yeah. and uh, the, the, the chance of surviving. Yeah. Uh, were these MDA levels uh, or the anti-MDA levels correlated in some way with MDA uh, modified protein levels in blood, like OxLDL or just yeah. MDA LDL? Uh, did you so, measure for that? Uh, because it's very difficult to measure a quantity. That's why we always take an arbitrary unit or a relative value. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know if a person is exposed to any kind of pathogen or any any of the disease condition happens throughout the life, right? So mm -hmm. we don't know at what point we should mention uh, we should measure this antibody level in the body. Yeah. So it is very... no, the, the antibody level that, that that's okay. Yeah, you need to measure at some point because yeah, you yeah. you, but, you but, only have a PhD of four years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but did you uh, consider to, to measure also the, 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 the antigen itself? Is that enhanced? Uh, because I know that OxLDL, and we, yeah. we all probably know that yeah. OxLDL is, uh, is is a contributing factor yes. in atherosclerosis, so so some cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't measured it, the, mm. the antigen levels, because we know when the cells are dying, so there are a lot of these antigens popping up or like exposing on the surface. So mm. like PC, as I said, or phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylcine, for example, to it. But we haven't done uh, any kind of antigen measurement, mm. but uh, antigens are always exposed. So that's how these antibodies mm. are generated and they go okay. higher. Okay, thank you. I'm really content with this answer. Is there time for a brief question with a brief answer? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the question relates to, uh, because then you go one step further even. Yeah. So you show that there's a difference in, uh, in, uh, in natural antibody levels. Yeah. Uh, also, you show that the, the, the IgG levels also yeah. uh, correlate. Uh, to my ex uh, knowledge, uh, IgG in cardiovascular disease uh, generally is considered to be uh, pro uh, atherogenic yeah. because IgM is, uh, uh, is uh, protective. What you observe actually is that both uh, sort of deteriorate the risk of uh, having a, a CKD associated mortality. Mm -hmm. So is there a completely different pathogenesis that underlies this process? No, uh, uh, I would like to answer in two ways again, <laughs> because it's really important for everyone to understand how, mm -hmm. why we choose anti-MD or anti-PC to it. Okay. The first is uh, when we talk about uh, like exposure, Okay, so it, it varies with the age and it varies with the with the exposure amount you have. So once these antibodies are on the surface, so that's how this uh, mostly in oxidized LDL, most part is like PC and mm. there are like a lot of phospholipids into it. So when they try to engulf uh, the macrophages, mm. so there is PC always have, or MDA 
helps in the clearance of dead cells. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah that, that, that proceeds via the, the FC uh, receptors, receptors yeah. uh, uh, which, at least for the IgG1, yeah. uh, goes uh, partly through an inhibitory itin yeah. uh, motive. Yes. And for the, uh, the, the IgG2, it yeah. goes via the activating and a sort of pathogenic, pathogenic exactly. one. So, but, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in your uh, cohort outcome because both are. Uh, Levels are higher in the uh, survivors. Uh, no, uh, but I would like Please to that, the uh, microphone. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, say something about that. When you look the results at carefully, IgG one and IgG two differs actually. Yeah, they are in opposite way for the paper one. So oh uh, yeah yeah yeah. Overlooked yeah. that. Yes, uh, color wise. Okay, so the, then apologies, and I give the word back to the director. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bishop. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Kublikiene. She is associate professor at Karolinska University Hospital and Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Dr. Kublikiene. Okay. Thank you very much, dear Prorector, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, dear candidate, it really was a pleasure to read your thesis, and uh, also I learning a lot. And uh, maybe I can start with a, with a very simple question. I mean, of course, it's your strengths in your study is the human material. And I just wondering, you know, that sometimes you call, you know, and divide your population due to gender and sometimes due to sex. So, so, so what is it? How you define sex and gender? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Carolina, for this question. Uh, so this is very important part of the uh, uh, of the cohort designing. Where when we design a cohort, so it's always age and gender match. So that is for the betterment of the population what we are targeting. So if we target a population where they are like 50% male, 50% female, that would be ideal to develop any kind of therapeutics to it. So, but that's not ideal case because as we all know, like female population, they always uh, uh, they are not co completing throughout the process of uh, the evaluation or what we say the sampling because there are a lot of dropouts from female population. So it's always male male who have more in the cohort study that, uh, than the female. So that's, you can see in all the cohort studies, it's not 50-50 balanced. It's one is like 65 and then 35 and things like that. So it, it differs. So, uh, so it's really important as well to have this gender, gender balance. If we, let's say, if I want to design a vaccine candidate, so I cannot particularly target only a male population or only on a female population. So it has to be for the whole society. So it has to have both the gender uh, matched and things. But in some diseases, I would really agree to your point that in terms of SLE, we have, as we have uh, seen this auto autoimmune disorder. So you have more of the female recruitment rather than male. So it's like 80 to 20% or something like that in that case. Thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate your... Uh, future intentions. The only thing I want to say that it's not wrong to say instead of gender sex, because indeed what you're looking in your studies, you're definitely looking for the sex as biological variable. And gender per se is actually the very broad, you know, the how to say social economical dimension, which is really, you know, not fitting here. I mean, in your presentation, you're saying, you know, females and you're saying gender. But indeed, you know, in your case, you're just only defying the sex as the biological variable. And I, I think and I hope you will use that in future. And that's uh, really great. And then I would really like, you know, because uh, can you a little bit stress, you know, the outcome from your studies here that you had? Because mainly you look, you know, for, for focus for the human anti-PCs and anti-MDS antibodies their function in the CKD and cardiovascular disease, and even, you know, in the patients with the COVID, could you specify exactly what kind of sex differences you found in details in paper one, in paper two, in paper three? Uh, I mean, not paper three, but and in the COVID. Uh, what exactly you, was extremely Carolina. relevant for females and males? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Carolina. Uh, just give me a moment. I'll just take out the uh, exact numbers. So, uh, and TMDA paper. So, and it's a Euromic cohort and it's called Mimic One. So, there we have uh, uh, both the male and female is like 55 and 62. 
I'm uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and... sorry, sorry, dear candidate. It's not like the numbers. I just want you know the to see the outcome. Is it something different, you know, between the females and males that you found? Yes. So uh, we found a lot of significant results uh, with uh, male population compared to female. So and that's also uh, corresponds to our hypothesis that uh, male have more of CVD events rather than female because of the lifestyle, because of a uh, lot of other factors and because of less amount of this antibodies present in the body. So uh, in paper one, you can see there is IgG1 is more significant in male rather than female. And IgG2 is significant in female rather than male. But IgG2 is a contradict to IgG1, as I was saying. So IgG1 goes in one way and IgG2 goes in a different way. So if you look at overall IgG at total, so if one is going two different ways, then it comes to a neutral. So that's why we always say IgM is far better predicting marker than IgGs. But if you have to subclass it, uh, then it's IgG1 who is best out of uh, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, thank you very much for, for that. And of course, for the time limit, I just want to also very curious because in the COVID, you know, patients, I mean, even if you are discussing, you have not even, you know, showed anything, you know, what is the ratio between females and males, even in the controls. So do you know how, how many females and males you have? Just to see if there are some differences. Uh, the overall patient, we had 134, and I think it was 30% female and 70% were male. Okay, so so that Lovely. is really Lovely. great, you know, that uh, you will, we are looking and you will look further. And then I come to the third paper that you really find that very exciting, me too, you know, to look for the bears and to learn from them. And it's also striked me, you know, that you had 12 bears, isn't it? And you have 12 female, you had nine females and three males, isn't it? Hibernation and not hibernation. Yeah? yeah, is this correct? Do you think it's, uh, it's do you think it's okay to to pull them together? Uh, no, we haven't pulled the samples. They were analyzed independently, but this is how the limitations of the nature. Like we cannot uh, like the, the the available number of bears were too low, and it is difficult to take samples at the baseline and then the follow-up studies. So if you can see, there are a lot of star marks in the in the analysis in the table. Uh, so each star mark has a point, like if it is two star, then it's two bears has taken for the analysis. If it's three star, then three bears has been taken for the analysis. Okay. And here it was very difficult for us to do on basis of gender with the limited number of samples and the power size. I mean, you, you want it, but then it is, you know, like what I find very interesting is actually when you look at GA and TPC bears individual data in your, you know, figure 18, you know, F, and when you present it individual, and you have four cases, four bears, which is really like showing, you know, like a double levels in comparison to others. Have you looked, you know, is it that like male bears or female bears? And how do you know that those bears are not pregnant during hibernation? They get pregnant, they get puppies. Do you know? That's the really nice question, but uh, unfortunately, I don't know the answer if they're pregnant or not. But uh, yeah, that might be an interesting point, and I would like to note that point and like to discuss further with my PIs. It's yeah, a really think, interesting point. Thank you for because, that. You know, yeah. for me, it's, it's, it's like these four bears that really shows like extreme, you know, pattern for the EGA and TPC, you know, this in your figure. So that would be really interesting to go and to see what is so special with them that they have, you know, like double higher levels of that. Okay, so I, uh, do I have few minutes? I want you actually to summarize your thesis because it's a long journey. And I would like you to identify three strengths and three weaknesses with your studies. Uh, like you are asking me, like three yes, strengths yes, I and want three you weaknesses. To so, okay. Judge your team <laughs> and to say three strengths and three weaknesses. Thank you. Okay, okay. so the three strengths is uh, I would uh, like I explored a lot in humans and a lot in animal kingdom. So that is like one which is really important for going for a applicative or therapeutic approach. The second thing is we did a gender basis analysis, which from which I could learn a lot of statistical tools. And I learned some in immunoinformatics stuff uh, from my PhD. And the third, I would say like, uh, um, it's more about uh, vaccination to drive what we started. 
and the drawbacks obviously there are a lot of drawbacks and limitations but i would like to take it in a positive way that uh, the drawbacks were like the cohorts were not uh, uh, like uh, they were good for the animal kingdom but it was not uh, balanced i would say like we had very few samples so if i get more samples of this thing so then we have more power of uh, analysis and then we can do better uh, uh, better prediction marker or we can have more of information gathered from this kind of samples so and yeah it's about the sample size and yeah i don't know what else to say about the limitation but it's more of a positive uh, thing which i learned and like that's that's what uh, i'm really happy about my thesis okay thank you very much it was a pleasure to discuss with you and uh, uh, thank you very much for your time and i'm happy with your answers so i will give the word to uh, the set opponent thank you Thank you, uh, Professor kubel uh, uh, The opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Searsche. He is Professor of Medical Sciences at uh, Örebro University in Sweden. Professor Searsche. Thank you, Dr. Rector. Uh, dear candidate, I have some questions when it comes to the method part, especially the assays of uh, antibodies. Uh, I have some experience with uh, measuring anti-PC <clears throat> and in, in my hands it was very unstable and varied a lot. Do you have any comments and how have you overcome this problem? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Allen. Uh, basically, like as you said, these antibodies, uh, you might get a different level because of the change in temperature. So these antibodies, I would say it's like a lot of, they're stable for quite a long time, which I have experienced in the lab. But if you just uh, freeze thaw it a lot of times, then you will definitely see a degrade in the level of these antibodies. So it's best to keep it at minus 80. And once you keep it at minus 20, then you should finish all the experiment, then it should go back to minus 80. Or it's better to have helicots of the samples. So you use one and then you don't get back to it. Because the freeze, if when you freeze it and then you refreeze it, then there are a lot of uh, changes happens. And with that, the antibody level decreases. That's what I have also observed previously with the experiments. But if you measure the antibodies uh, today and then you do the same in six months, do you get the same results then? Do you have any way of- For, for six months. Yes, yes, for six months, definitely it will be the similar levels with, because I have been working with these samples and for, uh, for example, I have taken some pool serum for my control and I use that control all the time for all the plates so that I know that each plate has ran on the same similar uh, environmental conditions. So then we take a ratio of internal control and the standard what we use. So I have kept that standard for uh, in 20 degrees from last two, three years and still I get the similar values, similar OD values. So I would say these are st uh, stable when I pull the serum from individual patients. So you adjust the values depending on this uh, standard serum you use. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I have done that. Yeah. And you have the specificity yeah. of this method. I saw in your uh, thesis that you have done some competition experiments, I think. And you can reduce the binding with 70% but you still have 30% left then. Is that done specific or it's... Yeah, so I would like to answer like, uh, because it cannot be 100% because we always, there is a competitor and then there is inhibitor. So the competitor is MDA and then the like MD or PC, whatever we see. And then we just try to mix it together and then we run it on a plate. So if you see on theoretical level, it can give us a value of 80 to 90%. But in practically, it will come to 70%. But we don't consider anything below 70% for publications and uh, for, for reality, because when, you, when it is inhibited, that means it is already binding in the, in the tube rather than binding to the plate. And then it's, if it's already bounded, so there are only few unbounded uh, antigens left on the plate. So it is amount of unbounded antibodies in the, in the sample, they will only bind to the uh, unbounded uh, antigens on the plate. So in that way, we can conclude like they are competing with each other. And that is a really good essay when we in terms of 
try to develop or standardize any kind of protocol uh, for further or uh, like for developing any kind of kit. So basically what kit, uh, these companies, they develop kit, so they have the standard value. So the standard value is calibrated against this, uh, this kind of inhibitory constant or like what you say is about the inhibition, like how the percentage of inhibition it's achieved. And the second thing is uh, these companies when they develop a kit, so they standardize according to the, uh, the instrument as well, because they have a linear range. So everything should come under the linear range. So for, for our instrument, it's basically one to four. Okay. This MDA antibody, uh, have you tried and see if there is any correlation with LDL levels? Do they follow each other? Uh, follow each other? Okay, the, the, you mean the MDA has a correlation with LDL? Yeah. That's yeah. That's what, okay, so uh, no, uh, basically like it's, it's a part of oxidized LDL. So once it's just LDL, so I don't think they will uh, expose to it or because it's a byproduct of a lipid peroxidation. So this is a chain of series of reactions to it. So uh, for that, I have not seen it, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's a good thing. Maybe we can see it in the future, but uh, it's also difficult to do the measurement of MDA as it was asked by one of the, uh, uh, asked by the chairperson today, like if you can quantify the level of MDA in the body. So that's mm -hmm. also difficult. So if you compare anti-MDA, yes, but we still don't know the time point where we should measure it because throughout the life we have a different point. So for ideal situation, I would say like, it will be when you pull a lot of serum together at different age point uh, from different patients, maybe it's completely. And then you can set a standard of like, okay, that's the average of 20 years or 30 years of people. And they came and then there is a level which is average of all the antibodies level. And maybe then you can do it, but it's, it's not that so easy as it sounds. Then I saw in your thesis that you have started a company. That means, I suppose, that you believe that uh, vaccination will be important for some diseases. Is that yes. correct? Uh, yes, Professor Allen. Uh, that's what, like me and Johan, we have a strong belief that this molecule, uh, this anti-PC antibodies, have a lot of significant roles in different diseases. So that's what I call it a one vaccine. So if if at all we succeed, like it will be one vaccine for different chronic inflammatory diseases. This vaccine works for preventing oxidized LDL to attached macrophages. This vaccine works in mechanistically. We have seen it in Alzheimer's, we have seen in cancer patients, we have seen it in uh, like uh, CKD, CVD, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE. So there are a lot of different diseases cohort we have analyzed. So which are not part of this thesis, but yeah, we had other projects where we found this thing. And then we went for the patent, and then now we have started the company as well. So you, you think we can vaccinate against uh, atherosclerosis then, or? <laughs> we can at least uh, delay the senescence, like uh, we can at least delay the, that part, and we are still trying to develop a vaccine to, to stop uh, oxidized LDL being attached to macrophages, and then following stopping the further process of being foamy cells and uh, plaque and then calcification. So that's what we believe. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sirsu. The opposition will be continued by Professor Hacking. He's Professor of Biochemistry at Maastricht University, and he is also the Secretary of this degree committee. Professor Hacking. Thank you, uh, Mr. Corrector. Uh, dear candidates, I would like to compliment you on this superb thesis with many beautiful new ideas and theories. Uh, it's also intriguing, uh, actually, as is uh, its author, I should say. Uh, and of course, these compliments also uh, apply to your promotion committee present here and in the cloud. Um, you thought us on, um, on natural antibodies, um, which is for me uh, sort of a new idea. And although they're obviously present, I think, all, all these years in us. So my first question is, you, you say these natural IgGs or IgMs, in this case, they support innate immunity. And, and you show this on page seven in this scheme. Uh, but then I look 
from the seven mechanisms in which these uh, natural antibodies support innate immunity, yes. only two are directed against invaders like pathogens and bacteria, and all the other ones are aimed at our own proteins and systems. So, uh, in another way, are we all autoimmunely compromised and is mankind sick? And I wouldn't be surprised if I see the current state of the world. So, what, a short reflection, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Tillman, for uh, <laughs> such a uh, nice question, which uh, which also uh, made my mind to think also on this question. That uh, because, as I said, this phosphatidylcholine antibodies, as you can see in the figure, it binds to uh, certain viruses with C1Q, which is a complement inhibitor factor. So uh, with C1Q, it binds, and then it only binds to uh, pathogens, which is like as we know, this is the uh, streptococcus pneumonia. I'm going to interrupt you, sorry, because this I understand, because yes. this is supporting uh, the uh, innate immunity because yes. it assists yes. in neutralizing invaders. Yes. But what about our own sweet proteins? I mean, we don't want to have antibodies against those, or no, like no, in, no. In, no? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't, we don't want to have, but we just want to have these antibodies at a certain level so that they can help in the clearance of dead cells. That is the first motive we have. And the second thing we have is uh, we want these antibodies to be protective against certain diseases by having a proper mechanistic uh, approach, which is like by inhibiting other, uh, by not activating the macrophages engulfing pathway like the phagocytosis. So basically, it's, it's my, my shortcoming. I always thought that autoimmune diseases were bad, but they're not. That's basically what no, you said. No, no, no. Autoimmune diseases are bad, when, bad these are, autoimmune, yeah. when these are in very high amount. Okay. And that's what we can see in the female population. That's yeah. what I said. And with SLE, so they have autoantibodies and they generate like a lot of autoimmune disorders. That's a different topic. Okay. But for the for your anti-PC antibodies, and I think yes. these are good for us. Huh? This is yes. what you, what you yes. say. Um, at what age in life do they appear? What did they disappear? They, they appear. They appear. Yeah. yeah. It's it's when you're uh, by when you're born. At the same time, you are born with very less amount, or maybe negligible amount. But in next two years, they go very very high. And then after a certain like four or five years, then they again start to fade down, depending on how much uh, exposed you are to the pathogens, because they are getting used up. But they are not again building up again and again. Okay. So that's why we want to boost the antibodies. Okay. And so that this could also explain why we don't have young COVID patients, especially no no fatalities. Uh, sorry, I can get your question. This would also explain why we don't have any young COVID patients yes. and, and certainly no fatalities. Okay. So that's, that's, again, we think like uh, the child, they have more of these antibodies and then they have a protective role. <clears throat> I was interested in the way the uh, phosphatidylcholine binds to yes. antibodies. And for that, let's go to page 35. Uh, and there you show some modeling of these uh, interactions yes. of uh, uh, phosphatidylcholine, I would suppose. But uh, it only shows the interaction if I look really closely to your little drawings. I see this uh, quaternary amine cation, and then I see this in orange, yes. the, the, the negative phosphate, uh, which together gives the neutral uh, phosphocholine head group. But yes. there's more to yeah. phosphatidylcholine than only this head group. And so how do you um, bring in the fatty acid change in this, this mechanism of binding? Because basically the head group is actually engulfed uh, mm -hmm. in, into this, uh, actually in between the two subunits, VH and VL of your yeah. antibodies. But where are the fatty acid chains? And, and how can the antibody pull out the PC molecule from a really stable bilayer? I mean, makes up like all our cellular compartments. It's very stable, it's fluid, but stable. How does it do it? Uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong, but uh, maybe it's due to post-translational modification. They try to, because, if we see this IgM antibody, this is a pentameric in nature, yeah. so it's all enclosed. Yeah. But when we see about this vaccination, what we have, so people focus on IgG, that's a monomeric, and it's it's monoclonal antibodies. Right. So this exposure, this engulfing like IgM is very close. So that's how uh, it is very difficult to predict any structures. But when we do it with IgG and mm -hmm. IgG1, so it's a single, it's just a Y shape, which has variable uh, light chain and variable heavy chain. Right. So there we see the epitope and paratop interacting for antigen and antibody. So that gives a space to analyze in the hydrophobicity or whatever analysis. I, I know, but I can see like the final structure where it's embedded like within the, the IgG part, let, let's call it like that. Yeah. But it has to pull it out. 
out of vegetation. Yeah, some way, yes. And you don't know how that happens? No, I don't know how this happens. Okay. But... Yeah, because you really show that there's an advantage of having these antibodies around in COVID. If you go yeah. like to page 43, um, you actually show, and you also did this in your introduction, uh, that when you have low, and, and you say very low levels, um, in case of the, the COVID uh, severity three cases, uh, yeah, it doesn't help. It, it basically, it kills you, yeah. that's what you say. Uh, yeah, basically, if, if the levels are really low, then yeah. you are about to die. So we can predict that outcome. You said this. So if you look at uh, figure two, uh, figure 20, and then you look at these three populations, which are yes. severity one, two, severity three, yeah. and healthy controls. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, they don't differ that much. I mean, they're significantly different, barely, uh, pH 0 0.02. Yeah. But 95% of the populations are identical. Yeah, so it's maybe nice on the population level, yeah. but it doesn't say a thing for on the individual level. And this is yeah. always the case with these, these kinds exactly. of studies. Exactly. It's a discussion about significance and relevance. But And if you look then at the purple, uh, the severity three, yeah. then I would be very unhappy if I would be the lowest yeah, IgG levels or the anti-PC uh, anti IgM levels. But if you look then in the B, these lowest ones are the ones that survive. Mm. So what do you say about that? Yes, uh, uh, very nice observation, Professor Tillman, because uh, I would like to uh, comment on the healthy population first, yeah. because in this cohort, uh, it is not uh, the one drawback about this cohort is we don't have a, a age and gender matched uh, population here. So yeah. these uh, healthy controls are very young compared to the what actual population we have for the treatment. So we will definitely see a very different levels of this antibodies profile, mm -hmm. and each individual will have a lot of uh, used of these antibodies throughout his life. As I say, like somebody has diabetes, somebody has high blood pressure, somebody has different diseases. So with the exposure of more and more of disease, this disease, then your uh, levels of these antibodies goes down. So as you pointed, the person who is having the least level will have more of these uh, underlying causes for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, that's how the antibodies levels are really low compared to the healthy controls, what we say they are disease-free, but still they are like younger population. Okay. I'm happy with your explanation. Thank you very much. I'll give the word back to the colleague. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Hake. Uh, the next opponent is uh, Dr. Koenen. He is Associate Professor at the Department of Biochemistry at Maastricht University. Dr. Koenen. Thank you, Mr. Paul Vector. Um, so uh, I would uh, like to uh, join uh, my predecessors in congratulating you. I, I think you have uh, produced and uh, written a very nice uh, booklet with a lot of experimental data, uh, most of it published, very well done. I also learned today that uh, bears do an extreme form of interval fasting, and that helps against uh, atherosclerosis. So, uh, you know, interval fasting, uh, maybe afterwards you can talk with uh, Professor Biese. Uh, I think he's a big uh, uh, fan of interval fasting and bears have obviously perfectionated that. But I would like to talk with you, of course, on your data. Um, so I read also with great interest your whole booklet, but I specialized on your study one, which is the study uh, in, I think it's the Journal of Clinical Medicine. Uh, am I correct? Let me see. Yeah, Journal of Clinical Medicine. And um, I was looking at the biomarkers, CRP and interleukin-6, and, um, and then I thought, oh, these are really small proteins, actually. They're all about 20, 25. And people who get hemodialysis, they lose a lot of protein, actually, over the membrane of the dialysis. So I was wondering, since these proteins, I looked it up, are in the range of the cutoff, permeability cutoff of the dialysis membrane of the hemodialysis, to what extent would actually the dialysis be a confounder for your study that the biomarkers you're just measuring are also lost doing or at least modified the concentrations doing dialysis? Do you have an impression on that? Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Roy. Uh, it's a really interesting question, and then I have to think. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a really valid question. I would say, when uh, when we determine this kind of biomarkers, as you said, the the the, the filtration membrane may have lost like a lot of uh, biomarkers there. 
But uh, I don't know, maybe in that case, we need to change the filters of the filtration membrane regularly to have, so that they don't clog or something like the, the protein uh, uh, wastage is not too much in terms of uh, sticking to the membrane and rather than not giving us the accurate result while uh, filtration process and things like that. That's how we use this because these patients are CKD5D. So they are almost about like uh, their kidney is not functioning about 95%. So they have to be on dialysis for four, three to four days a week, I believe. And mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, that's a really difficult task for anyone to you know, uh, go through all this process and things like that. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Uh, so I, I also wanted to um, touch down a little bit on a discussion uh, that, that Professor Biso already uh, did uh, with you on uh, the different isotypes. And uh, you measured the different isotypes and very interesting. And you saw some very impressive effects, for, for example, IgM, and some very remarkable things also with IgG isotype 2. Um, I read, because I always look things up uh, in preparation, that the isotype 2 is actually directed primarily at bacterial capsids, carbohydrates, also viral carbohydrates. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, why do we have an isotype 2? You know, what can we say? about the modifications that MDA does, because when you're talking about anti-MDA, you mean actually anti-modified MDA species, if I'm correct. So what can the isotype tell us about the immune reaction that's actually taking place in our body and, and about the antigens that are modified by MDA, Malone de What basically happens with uh, MDA is MDA Anti-MDA doesn't go and bind to MDA. It always needs a, a carrier protein. That's why we always okay. conjugate MDA with HSA. So it's a human serum albumin. And then we have other like KLH and other components, but it's more stable with HSA. That's what we, we, we found with our experimental setup when we do the cell cultures. So basically uh, what we can say is uh, MDA has a distinct thing, but it also has a pocket kind of structure that's that's why it's very difficult to detect IgA and TMDA. As I said uh, in the paper three with the bear, we couldn't detect Ig, IgA and TMDA to it. But for IgG, uh, as I said, like IgG is the most abundant uh, in the circulus as we know. And then we have IgG one, two, three, and four, the further subclasses. So IgG three and four are too negligible, negligible amount in the body. So it's not able to detect, to detect. So we are left with IgG one and IgG two. So IgG one has a very different role as as you also already mentioned about like in terms of uh, uh, protection, but IgG2 is more mostly related to pathogen and bacterial uh, cascades. That is what we see. So when we taken, when we took all this thing into, uh, uh, into a single plane and when we decipher the thing, so we would like to say, or I would like to say that IgG2 works better with uh, pathogenic impact and it has a better marker when we have uh, ongoing infection in the body. So if, if there is infection, ongoing infection, we will definitely see a different pattern of IgG2 compared to IgG and IgG1. So can it also look at that, that simply carbohydrate moieties are also, because we have a lot of carbohydrates in our body on the cell membrane, and maybe that's because you're always talking about proteins being modified by MDA. And of course, I also see that you use your antigen is serum albumin couple or modified with MDA, but maybe you're missing a big part of the antigens that is actually uh, MDA modified carbohydrates, maybe even MD5 more modified nucleic acids or lipids that you might see if you would take, for example, another antigen. And it also gives some information about the underlying pathophysiology, wouldn't you think? That's a brilliant idea. We have never explored that part of uh, study. At least I, I, I have never explored because it's always about the protein, as you said, uh, to be a more stable compound, but we never explored the carbohydrate chain and provided with the MDA molecule. Because maybe the MDA is um, such a good predictor because the IgM binds to very much more. Eh? It's, it's, it's uh, because the T cells actually are only, are only the respondents against the protein component of an antigen, but the T cell, the B cell receptor and also IgM uh, binds to everything. So maybe that's also a more broadly encompassing 
antibody. But I don't know. Maybe maybe that is um, one question because I don't hear the pedal. Uh, maybe he is already on his way. But um, so I was wondering about the inflammation because that's very interesting in that study. I think. And how did you come to this cutoff? Because you define inflamed patients, patients with inflammation. You define it with the cutoff of C-reactive protein. How did you come with the cutoff of 5.6? I wrote it down here as 5.6. How did you define it? I think uh, uh, for inflamed patient, we choose more than 5.6 uh, liter per ml or something that that's the concentration. And I think it was taken from international nomenclature or something. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly remember from where it was taken, but I think it's a standard uh, CRP level where you see if above that is like you consider as a, uh, uh, it's a inflamed and below that you can consider they are not, not inflamed in terms of IL-6 and other, but this is in terms of HSCRP levels. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I'm simply very surprised why you completely lose this perfect distinguished between uh, the, the low and the, and the higher tertiles if there's inflammation in play. And I have just, uh, I, I also heard about the discussion you want to vaccinate people. And what about if you vaccinate people and then they turn up to have very high CRP levels? Don't you think that they're all of a sudden at risk? As you have seen and noticed and heard, the time for defending your thesis has passed. Okay. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And please await our return with the results of our deliberations. Thank you, Product. Thank 
I also didn't understand the accent, you know, because people say, yeah, yeah, it's like mute, that, right? No, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, we're just telling that that it's no, no problem. We will get into the thing. From the quick comes out, how do you get to the quick? Then you will. No, no, you answered my I I only didn't know one question which I didn't understood also. It was it was Tilman's question about the hydrophobicity about the chemistry because that's not I told you yesterday. I told him I called him. I told him uh colin read about the structure. No, no, I no, I read but the question, you know what was the question? The question is there are a lot of glycine, glycine uh aniline and all the residues around the surface. And the antibody is a flow structure. Hmm. So how this how antibody the... flips or changes so that this structure comes in line and this ah, okay. now okay. I can I process can, it. I can that. I yeah. uh, but but I don't know exact mechanism. So I cannot ah, like, like, like if you have like uh, alanine and leucine, they're like yeah. tiny yeah. acids, like uh, amino acids, they like very little no charge. Yeah. You just like yeah. get the fuck away. There's something more. And that was that was bioinformatics in my context. Yeah, that's complete, and that yeah. then I don't know how like I know what is it in interpret, but how to change the structure. That's why it is, it's, it's, uh, it's not my topic. Uh, no, no, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's probably interaction. Yeah, interaction also the buffer itself. Yeah. 
for example, if you do it in the floor, yeah, or on maybe, maybe. or if you do it in another buffer or compressor, or, or, or it maybe can be like uh, you know with the uh, uh, with the charge, with the charge you can fold it, yeah, with the charge, yeah, charge and you can start like, interaction, or maybe you can do a protein corona formation. I don't know, but I could have given that example, but I could like okay, sometime I have to say no, I don't know, but or yeah, I mean, it's not they will just continue to go on this thing. I can agree. So you know, like they're, they're going to come out and they're going to say something to you, and you have to say, "I promise that." Yeah. Like yeah. about scientific yeah. integrity. Yeah. Oh, so you have to take the whole scientific. Yeah. 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 Too many, too many, too many, too many crops. Yeah. Yeah. Like Was it a bit rude when I still felt I like maybe you have to leave that because you haven't already? No, 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 no. Because that's what the result is. No, no, no. Yeah, asked me the question, but no, no, it's fine. No, no, no. no, 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 no. I think it went nice, not. But, no, it's a tough and, and, and I think they went a little bit hard. Yeah. Like it wasn't like that. Like, like you know, they, they weren't. Uh, it wasn't all light questions. They, yeah. like, they were like, because then it's like maybe they would see like you know with publication. Okay, this is a good, a good thing. We have to ask whether this is a question. Yeah, they were asking. Yeah. If, if it's like half unpublished, then it's like maybe they can ask some more foundation stuff. Like you need to find holes about the control. But, but at least I'm glad that you know they could have time to research a little bit because. Committee change, committee watch change on site. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, okay. I, don't know. I was expecting a few more, but when I went to someone, I went into someone's office at like uh, about 11 o'clock and he was sitting there with the pizza. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> he has written a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. They can't hear it. Mm -hmm. I think I've talked a lot of stuff. Can you hear Anyone online? If you do. Yeah. Represent intricate in the house. Warning intricate people. I mean, that's a natural body process. It's okay, man. Yeah, they will have my story about that. <laughs> The man just literally came down and said, put you on mute. Maybe we can ask him to come Maybe. down. Like, hmm? I can just ask him to come to there and speak in English. No, it's fine. No, no, I you can't hear it. No, it's on. It's on. It's on. Online is off. The, the guy said, put him on mute. Yeah, one of these. Um, and now it's a party time. No, the one who has been. I'm yeah, relaxed, give, give us a credit card, pink card, we'll pull out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Now we get to the table. Good job, though, when it was very nice. People should understand. So. Yeah, yeah. And That's you more important. almost everything. Yeah. So, some of your slides were a bit like a text. Yeah, because I couldn't read because of the resolution of the computer. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why they had a video. Yeah. Oh. That was very bad. I didn't see my real presentation in the because I wanted to have it. I made it very nice with expression and things. That way you did it anyway. Because even. Maybe for the KI one. Like, yeah, because, picture. you know, the thing is, I wanted to show this thing. I cannot even see what it is again. No, it's very difficult to see. And this is like too blurred. <laughs> Just have to assume. <laughs> and this, I have to see this video because this was a very important one. So, yeah, I think they saw it for a good one minute. That's all, man. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting the degree, I think. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not with the skill in the degree. Yes. Are you like in competition with someone? You want to get like as high as possible? It's like 10,000. <laughs> Maybe it's a spam. Like 100,000. It's not 10,000. That's 100,000. Oh, yeah, it's 100,000. Jesus. Uh, I think it's the skill of spamming you. That's right. <laughs> no, you know what happened? We are hacked. Uh, it's like uh, I, a few days back, I just uh, wanted to have integrated all the things in my phone. So it will do all the email, all my logins, all, all the numbers together, and it is all in my Marker tool has done that. Yeah, I mean, don't need it now. <laughs> now you pay your pay Give me one, give me one. Yeah. <laughs>
and I showed in the lab presentation, people were studying with the table. So, you know, with these kind of studies, the, the clinician they prefer to have table. This paper was with circulation and circulation issues for really long time, maybe around eight months or something. And they wanted to have only a table, because they don't understand what is just happening. We just want numbers. So, so then we published every single paper, but we had this security on this table. This is the real data. This is the real data. This is the real data. No, but for clinicians, they will, they will not let you publish in very good clinical journal because of the graphs, because they want this table. So it's all table. But for researchers, like, it's like, why you want to go on particular topic and see the confidence and then you see like it's a key value and then it's a key value.
that's the drawback of the film. That's that's the reason we are not able to come in contact. They they also speak maybe some words. But you have got a better data because this is a very old case. It's not that. Has it done long now? Yeah. So remember last time. Adash. 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 He cannot go out, right? Why is he going to gonna come back any minute now? Can you call him? What? Chengi, they're coming now. Chengi, they're coming. You can see them. Okay. Arindam, bhai ja bolega. Ek phone bhai bolega. Ek apne mein tu lega. Mr. Charles Kumar Sama, the degree committee here present, and not only here but also present online, has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor of Maastricht University. Uh, Professor Reutlingsberg is authorized to confer upon you uh, this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law. And I invite now your supervisor to take the floor. First, Mr. Shalesh Kumar Samal, I want to ask you a question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. That's a good answer. By the authority invested vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present and online, I hereby confer upon you, Shalesh Kumar Samal, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisors affixed with the official seal of the university, shown by the beacon. Dear Dr. Samal, dear Shalesh, before handing over or giving the word to the, your supervisor, Johan, who is now in Stockholm, I want to like, I want to congratulate you. It's, it's an honor. And as already uh, mentioned, you are the can, one of the participants of the IntriCare Consortium that was initiated and uh, coordinated by our, or your supervisor, uh, Leon. And I would like to, uh, to say that it was great having you in this consortium and it was great how you finalized this by this uh, doctorate. Thank you very much. And I'll give the word, but before I want to thank all the opponents for being present in this uh, ceremony and for the contribution. Thank you. And the laudatio, is further given by Johan. So, so, can you hear me now? Yes. So, so uh, Shalesh, I would really like to congratulate you. I think you did a very good presentation. 
uh, and it w- was nice to hear you talking. I think we've been, I think we met about five years ago um, because you, was, you were in the lab a little bit before the formal infant care PhD study started. And, and uh, I think yeah, time flies and, uh, and it, it's, it's been a very funny, funny time, I think. Uh, I think um, lots of unexpected development, I think, happened during this, this uh, uh, time. And I think it's very good that you are both a funny and very flexible person because we had lots of fun and we had to change plans for different reasons. One is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course, which made that we we couldn't, some of the studies were complicated to do. We had planned to do more of the experimental work on, on atherogotic plaques, but that was difficult because of the planned operations decreased and so on. Where to switch and change. I think um, in general, I think you had developed very much. I think you, you uh, uh, the writing, for example, has become good. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, the, if I take up some, some highlights of, the, of this time, I think we'll, that's been, uh, one is, of course, that we, we did find lots of very interesting uh, um, um, results uh, related to antipisi, which I, I've been working on that for a long time, and, and uh, uh, that was interesting. I think the, the funniest story uh, study, I think, is one on bears, which was not something we planned five years ago, but that came up a um, uh, little bit unexpectedly, and and uh, it was, you never know what would happen, but but it turned out to be be interesting and, and funny findings, I think. But now we start to study other animals also, actually tigers and polar bears and so on. Uh, then I think um, COVID-19, instead of, of, of um, uh, that, that influenced the, the studies, as I said, but instead we came up also unexpectedly, this whole story about the, um, the, um, the anti-PC associations, which are also unexpected, I think, and here, I think your, your creativity and flexibility was very good because you, you had contact, lots of contacts. And, and one, one of those were with the artificial intelligence people from Uppsala, who, who and together we, we developed uh, really, a, I think, funny, uh, a funny strategy, I think, to combine AI with uh, experimental and clinical studies. Also, I should say also that it's, um, it was it was really quite complicated to to do two PhD uh, um, studies at the same time because the systems are a little bit different, not that different, I would say, but still it's a lot of bureaucracy. There's lots. There were lots of last minute changes, even one or two two hours before you you had to do the nailing, which is a very formal thing in in Stockholm. It, it came up that the the um, uh, the thesis, the front page had to be changed, which I thought, oh, well, now, now we, we can't make it, but, but we did. And you did that by, by acting swiftly, I think. And, and the printing press managed to print three books with the correct um, front page. So I think in general, um, I think it's been a very funny time and, and uh, we plan to, to do lots of things. We will apply for new grants and Hopefully, uh, there will be lots of more funny development. So, congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for your laudatio. Esteemed Dr. Samal, dear Shailesh, um, it's my great pleasure to um, congratulate you with your doctorate from Maastricht University. And I do that also on the board of deans of Maastricht University. And I would like to share some, um, some comments and some impressions from the committee with you. We have seen a good and clear and detailed presentation. You took somewhat more time than allowed, but okay, that is fine. We enjoyed it. And we saw a good thesis, sometimes quite detailed, but a high quality, we appreciated the quality, but still there are some, um, there's still some criticism on parts of your thesis, but that will not surprise you, yes. I guess. And your defense was, uh, was good. We had a, a good impression. We are satisfied with your defense. And we saw um, now a young doctor who's passionate, but also very confident, 
knowledgeable, to the point, and very dedicated to his research and his work. And we congratulate you again, and not only you, but I would also like to congratulate your three supervisors. Um, Professor Chris Reutlingsberger, Professor Leon Schurgers, and Professor Johan Frostegaard. Uh, congratulate, uh, congratulations with uh, the results that we have seen in the form of a good thesis and a, and a very good defense. Um, of course, I would like to include in my congratulations uh, your family. Your father is here, um, your mother cannot be here. But we congr I congratulate um, you, your parents, and also other members of your family, including your brother, of course. And um, I would also like to include in my congratulations all the people who have contributed to your thesis. And I think these are quite a lot of people, as I've seen. Yes. Uh, congratulations to all of them. And um, I wish you, of course, a very successful career and a happy personal life. And I have no doubts that that will occur. Um, I would like to thank all the members of this degree committee and of the assessment committee. And in particular, I would like to, um, to thank the external members and the uh, opponents for their questions and their contributions to, the, to an interesting and scientific discussion. Before I uh, close this ceremony, um, I would like to ask you to sit here for a short moment when we take a picture afterwards. And before we take the picture, I would like to give the word to the opponents and the people who are present here online. And I would like first to ask, um, let me take the order of opposition. First, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Carolina Kublier. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Now uh, Shailesh Kumar Samal. It was a pleasure to be a part of this journey and also position. Well done. And uh, I wish you to stay passionate, to stay cautious, uh, to appreciate diversity and help to everyone. Think globally act locally so well done thank you i would like to give the word to professor Sirsje. yes congratulate you Shalice. it was really a nice act and you did very well i really enjoyed your presentation and also your answers on the questions. A good luck in the future, and I will see you in Stockholm, I suppose. I hope, anyway. Second of June. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to give finally the word to uh, Dr. Kuna. Yeah, dear Dr. Samal, dear Shailesh, very well done. My best. Wishes to you, and uh, of course also, oh, uh, all the best uh, to uh, uh, to you and, and and your family, and uh, for also the best, all the best for the rest of your career. And your screen disappeared, so I was a little bit uh, confused, but now I see you again. So I hope you heard everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your congratulations. And uh, before I end this ceremony, I would like to hand over to you the certificate that uh, states that you have indeed uh, acquired the doctoral degree, which is signed by the Rector Magnificus of the University. I'll give that to in a minute to you. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony. And now we will take a picture here. Uh, so I would like to invite you to stay in, in front of